The prayer of the Blessed Virgin was unceasing. She ever kept her eyes fixed interiorly on Jesus and was perfectly consumed by her ardent desire of once more beholding him, whom she loved with such an inexpressible love. Suddenly an angel stood by her side and bade her arise and go to the door of the dwelling of Nicodemus, for that the Lord was very near. The heart of the Blessed Virgin leaped for joy. She hastily wrapped her cloak about her and left the holy women without informing them where she was going. It was about nine o'clock at night, and the Blessed Virgin had almost reached the entrance when I saw her stop suddenly in a very solitary spot and look upward in an ecstasy of delight. For on the top of the town hall she beheld the soul of our Lord, resplendent with light without the appearance of a wound and surrounded by patriarchs. He descended toward her, turned to his companions, and presenting her to them, he said, Behold Mary, behold my mother. He appeared to me to salute her with a kiss, and then he disappeared. The Blessed Virgin knelt down and most reverently kissed the ground on which he had stood, and the impression of her hands and knees remained imprinted upon the stones. This sight filled her with inexpressible joy, and she immediately rejoined the holy women, who were busily employed in preparing the perfumes and spices. She did not tell them what she had seen, but her firmness and strength of mind were restored. She was perfectly renovated, and therefore comforted all the rest, and endeavored to strengthen their faith. I soon after beheld the tomb of our Lord. All was calm and silent around it. There were six who were either seated or standing before the door, and Cassius was among them. His appearance was that of a person immersed in meditation and in the expectation of some great event. The sacred body of our blessed Redeemer was wrapped in the winding sheet and surrounded with light, while two angels sat in an attitude of adoration, the one at the head and the other at the feet. I had seen them in the same posture ever since he was first put into the tomb. My next vision was so mysterious that I cannot explain or even relate to it in a clear manner. It appeared to me that the soul and body of Jesus were taken together out of the sepulchre, without, however, the former being completely reunited to the latter. I thought I saw two angels who were kneeling and adoring at the head and feet of the sacred body raise it keeping it in the exact position in which it was lying in the tomb, and carry it uncovered and disfigured with wounds across the rock, which trembled as they passed. It then appeared to me that Jesus presented his body, marked with the stigmata of the Passion, to his heavenly Father, who, seated on a throne, was surrounded by innumerable choirs of angels blissfully occupied in pouring forth hymns of adoration and jubilee. At this moment, the rock was so violently shaken, from the very summit to the base, that three of the guards fell down and became almost insensible. The other four were away at the time, being gone to the town to fetch something. The guards who were thus thrown prostrate attributed the sudden shock to an earthquake. I again beheld the holy women. They had finished preparing the spices, and they were resting in their private cells not stretched out on the couches, but leaning against the bedclothes which were rolled up. They wished to go to the sepulchre before the break of day, because they feared meeting the enemies of Jesus. But the Blessed Virgin, who is perfectly renovated and filled with fresh courage since she had seen her son, consoled and recommended them to sleep for a time, and then go fearlessly to the tomb, as no harm would come to them, whereupon they immediately followed her advice and endeavored to sleep. It was toward eleven o'clock at night when the Blessed Virgin, incited by irrepressible feelings of love, arose, wrapped a gray cloak around her, and left the house quite alone. When I saw her do this, I could not help feeling anxious and saying to myself, How is it possible for this Holy Mother, who is so exhausted from anguish and terror, to venture to walk all alone through the streets at such an hour? I saw her go to the palace of Pilate, which was at a great distance off. I watched her through the whole of her solitary journey along that part which had been trodden by her son, loaded with his heavy cross. She stopped at every place where our Savior had suffered particularly, or had received any fresh outrage from his barbarous enemies. 
I accompanied her through the whole of her pious pilgrimage, and I endeavored to imitate her to the best of my power, as far as my weakness would permit. Mary then went to Calvary, but when she had almost reached it, she stopped suddenly, and I saw the sacred body and soul of our Savior standing before her. An angel walked in front, the two angels whom I had seen in the tomb were by his side, and the souls whom he had redeemed followed him by hundreds. The body of Jesus was brilliant and beautiful, but its appearance was not that of a living body, although a voice issued from it, and I heard him describe to the Blessed Virgin all he had done in limbo, and then assure her that he should rise again with his glorified body, that he would then show himself to her, and that she must wait near the rock of Mount Calvary. Our Savior then went toward Jerusalem, and the Blessed Virgin, having again wrapped her veil about her, prostrated on the spot which he had pointed out. I beheld the soul of our Lord between two angels who were in the attire of warriors. It was bright, luminous, and resplendent as the sun at midday. It penetrated the rock, touched the sacred body, passed into it, and the two instantaneously united and became as one. I then saw the limbs move and the body of our Lord being reunited to his soul and to his divinity, rise and shake off the winding sheet. The whole of the cave was illuminated and lightsome. I then saw the glorified body of our Lord rise up and it passed through the hard rock easily. The earth shook, and an angel in the garb of a warrior descended from heaven with the speed of lightning, entered the tomb, lifted the stone, placed it on the right side, and seated himself upon it. At this tremendous sight, the soldiers fell to the ground and remained there apparently lifeless. When Cassius saw the bright light which illuminated the tomb, he approached the place where the sacred body had been placed, looked at and touched the linen cloth in which it had been wrapped, and left the sculpture, intending to go and inform Pilate of all that had happened. However, he tarried a short time to watch the progress of events, for although he had felt the earthquake, seen the angel move the stone, and looked at the empty tomb, he had not yet seen Jesus. At the very moment in which the angel entered the sculpture in the earthquake, I saw our Lord appear to his Holy Mother on Calvary. His body was beautiful and lightsome, and its beauty was that of a celestial being. He was clothed in a large mantle, which looked dazzlingly white, as it floated through the air, waving to and fro with every breath of the wind, and the next reflected a thousand brilliant colors as the sunbeams passed over it. His large open wounds shone brightly and could be seen from a great distance. The wounds in his hands were so large that a finger might be put into them without difficulty and rays of light proceeded from them, diverging in the direction of his fingers. The souls of the patriarchs bowed down before the mother of our Savior, and Jesus spoke to her concerning his resurrection, telling her many things which I have forgotten. He showed her his wounds, and Mary prostrated to kiss his sacred feet, but he took her hand, raised her, and disappeared. The holy women were very near the door of Nicodemus's house at the moment of our Lord's resurrection, but they did not see anything of the prodigies which were taking place at the sculpture. They were not aware that guards had been placed around the tomb, for they had not visited it on the previous day on account of it being the Sabbath. They questioned one another anxiously concerning what would have to be done about the large stone at the door as to who would be the best person to ask about removing it, for they had been so engrossed by grief that they had not thought about it before. Their intention was to pour precious ointments upon the body of Jesus, and then to strew over it flowers of the most rare and aromatic kinds, thus rendering all the honor possible to their divine master. The holy women came to the determination of putting down their spices on the stone which closed the door of the monument and waiting until somebody came to roll it back. The guards were still lying on the ground, and the strong convulsions which even then shook them clearly demonstrated how great had been their terror, and the large stone was cast on one side so that the door could be opened without difficulty. I saw the holy women coming into the garden, 
But when they perceived the light given by the lamps of the sentinels and the prostrate forms of the soldiers around the tomb, they became much alarmed and retreated toward Golgotha. Mary Magdalene was, however, more courageous and followed by Salome entered the garden while the other women remained timidly on the outside. Magdalene started and appeared for a moment terrified when she drew near the sentinels. She retreated a few steps and rejoined Salome, but both quickly recovered their presence of mind and walked on together through the mist of the prostrate guards and entered into the cave which contained the sculpture. They immediately perceived that the stone was removed, but the doors were closed, which had been done in all probability by Cassius. Magdalene opened them quickly, looked anxiously into the sculpture, and was much surprised at seeing the cloths in which they had enveloped our Lord lying on one side, and that the place where they had deposited the sacred remains was empty. A celestial light filled the cave, and an angel was seated on the right side. Magdalene became almost beside herself with disappointment and alarm. I do not know whether she heard the words which the angel addressed to her, but she left the garden as quickly as possible and ran to the town to inform the apostles who were assembled there of what had taken place. In the meantime, Cassius had remained near the sculpture in hopes of seeing Jesus, as he thought he would appear to the holy women. But seeing nothing, he directed his step towards Pilate's palace to relate to him all that had happened, stopping, however, first at the place where the rest of the holy women were assembled, to tell them what he had seen and to exhort them to immediately go to the garden. They followed his advice and went there at once. No sooner had they reached the door of the sculpture than they beheld two angels clothed in vestments of the most dazzling white. The women were very much alarmed, covered their faces with their hands, and prostrated almost to the ground. But one of the angels addressed them, bade them not to fear, and told them they must not seek for their crucified Lord there, for that he was alive, had risen, and was no longer an inhabitant of the tomb. He pointed out to them at the same moment the empty sculpture, and ordered them to go and relate to the disciples all that they had seen and heard. He likewise told them that Jesus would go before them into Galilee, and recalled to their minds the words that the Savior had addressed to them on a former occasion. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of sinners. He will be crucified, and the third day rise again. The angels then disappeared and left the holy women filled with joy, although of course greatly agitated. They wept, looked at the empty tomb and linen clothes, and immediately started to return to town. In the meantime, Magdalene reached the cenacle. She was so excited, she appeared like a person beside herself and knocked hastily at the door. Some of the disciples were still sleeping, and those who were risen were conversing together. Peter and John opened the door, but she only exclaimed without entering the house, They have taken away the body of my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him, and immediately returned to the garden. Peter and John went back into the house, and after saying a few words to the other disciples, followed her as speedily as possible. But John far outstripped Peter. I then saw Magdalene re-enter the garden and direct her steps toward the sculpture. She appeared greatly agitated, partly from grief and partly from having walked so fast. Being alone, she was afraid of entering the cave, but stopped for a moment on the outside and knelt down in order to see better in the tomb when she perceived the two angels. I heard one of them address her thus, Woman, why are you weeping? She replied in a voice choked with tears, for she was perfectly overwhelmed with grief at seeing the body of Jesus was really gone, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She said no more, but seeing the empty winding sheet, she went out of the sculpture and began to look about in other parts. She felt a secret presentiment that not only should she find Jesus, but that he was even then near to her and the presence of the angels seemed not to disturb her in the least. She did not appear even to be aware that they were angels. Every faculty was engrossed with one thought. Jesus is not there. Where is Jesus? She then raised her head, looked around, and perceived a tall figure, clothed in white, standing at about ten paces from the sculpture. The figure was partly hidden from her sight by a palm tree, but she was somewhat startled when it addressed her in these words. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She thought it was the gardener, and in fact, he had a spade in his hand, 
and a large hat, apparently made of the bark of the trees, on his head. His dress was similar to that worn by the gardener described in the parable which Jesus had related to the holy women a short time before his passion. His body was not luminous. His whole appearance was rather that of a man dressed in white and seen by twilight. At the words, Whom are you seeking? She looked at him and answered quickly, Sir, if you have taken him, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And she looked anxiously around. Jesus said to her, Mary. She then instantly recognized his beloved voice and turning quickly replied, Rabboni. She threw herself on her knees before him and stretched out her hands to touch his feet. But he motioned her to be still and said, Do not touch me, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. He then disappeared.